Hot. Well, good afternoon. Is the mic hot yet over there? Good afternoon. There we go. So let's start with 1970. 1970. Can anyone tell me the picture of the year in 1970? If you can, you will have Googled it. I'm sure, Rich. So Patton was the movie of the year. So sort of a, not a forgettable film, but not one you'd think. The song, Bridge Over Troubled Water, the year of the Apollo 13. And sadly, the Beatles broke up in 1970. And in 1970, I was a couple of years old. I was born in 1968. And we had about 3,000 people in prison at that time. And we spent about $5 million. 3,000 people in prison spent about $5 million. And as I began to grow and, uh, from a toddler to a, a kid with a really bad mullet at about 17 or 18, <laughs> thought it was cool then, not so cool now, our prison population began to grow. Let's fast forward to the decade that ended in 2009 when I began to work in this field a little bit. I've been in criminal justice about 25, 26 years, but I was in the midst of that, and it was lost on me that we were growing our prison population at an unsustainable rate. So for that decade that ended in 2009, our prison growth rate was 45%. Well, that probably means nothing to you until I put it in some context, which is the national average, national prison growth rate, was 13% at a time when all state prison populations were exploding. And in fact, the U.S. makes up 4.5% of the world's population, less than 5%, yet we comprise 25%. Better said, we incarcerate 25% of the world's prisoners. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. The United States incarcerates more than any other country. Women, one out of every three women incarcerated worldwide sits in a prison or jail cell right here in our country. And in Kentucky, we still have, despite reforms which have stabilized our population significantly, we still have the second highest rate of female per capita incarceration in the country. And why am I telling you all this? Because it's due to this drug scourge without question. We don't have time to pull back the curtain and show you exactly why and how and look at numbers from the court system or from law enforcement or from our office in drug control policy or from our cabinet, but let me assure you that it's due to this scourge, to this epidemic that has now become a pandemic due to opioids and heroin. So I told you about those women, by the way. I have three daughters, so that's, that's particularly troublesome to me that we incarcerate more women than any other state but Oklahoma, and we'll soon surpass them because they've passed some significant reforms that we've not yet been able to get past. And our growth rate for women in prisons today is five times out of our male growth rate. So we are spiraling out of control. The last thing I'll say about women in prison is that we have more women in prison than the state of New York. I mean, let that one sink. And there are nine million people in New York City alone twice that of our own state population, yet we have more people in prison, women in prison, than the state of New York. That's not per capita, that's total. And the last thing that should be troublesome to us all is that Kentucky leads the world, not just our country, in children impacted by incarceration. Some 33 to 35,000 kids have had or currently have a parent in prison or jail. What do you think the future looks like for that child, which by the way, that incarceration represents an adverse childhood experience, which makes it all the more likely that that child will end up in a jail or prison cell. So to my left, I see Dave Atkinson, who rightly said, Dave, uh, not too long ago, that our workforce and our people have been decimated by addiction and incarceration. No truer words have ever been spoken, Dave. And thanks, I want to thank those who served on the Kentucky Chamber Board and Dave and his staff, because the Kentucky Chamber was one of the first business groups in the country to step forward back at a time when not all business groups and not all people were stepping forward to acknowledge this crisis. Not just the drug crisis, everyone could acknowledge that in some way, maybe not take any action on it. But this human crisis of mass incarceration due to what is a drug scourge. 
But the chamber here in Kentucky was, if not the first, one of the first to step forward. I can remember when I would speak across the country, I was always proud to be able to claim that because there was a, a nice little pamphlet, John, at the back of the room that said right-sizing prisons. The chamber stood for the leaky bucket theory that we were leaking money through corrections. Let me put that in perspective for you. A minute ago, I told you that we spent about $5 million in 1970. At the end of this fiscal year, as, as John Chilton knows full well, I had a meeting yesterday, $650 million. And our prison population is now at 24,000. So that population has grown 700% since 1970. But our population, our state population, has only grown 38%. Are we any more evil then? Or were we more evil then now? What's the, what's, what's the reason for that? Again, I'll take you back to drugs and the latest opioids. The latest opioids. We can talk a little bit about that, but I'll share a story with you. On my way here, I was coming from a meeting out on Blankenbaker with a, a, a corporate group that wants to employ those who are suffering from addiction and who have criminal records. They want to because, as I hope you've heard today, and I'll touch on that a little bit if I have time, as my, my time ticks down, I'll touch on why that's a good idea and why that's very doable for you and your companies. By the way, it's next to impossible not to, right? With 130 or 40 or 50,000 open jobs in the state. And oh, by the way, there are 70 million Americans with criminal records. 70 million Americans with a criminal record. Companies like Uber and Home Depot have found that they actually make very loyal employees, good employees. Folks like Brown Foreman and Papa John's, I know, have taken steps to engage in a conversation. I've been lucky to be part of two business roundtables at the White House, one under the Obama administration and one under the Trump administration, that shows you the nonpartisan nature of this space. That's what's so good about it. We can come together on issues like this one, not just criminal justice reform, but drug policy. It all fits together. The need for more mental health services. Because make no mistake, two-thirds of those who have a substance use disorder also suffer from a mental illness. And the opposite is true. So oftentimes, the reality is a co-occurring disorder. Whether they self-medicate or not, some would suggest that that SUD, Mitchell, causes that mental illness, but I think that's actually probably incorrect. I think oftentimes people are suffering from something in their lives. Maybe it's trauma. Maybe it's a mental illness that's securely rooted in their DNA. It doesn't make any difference. We need to move past this being a moral failing. Move past judgment of this, because the fact of the matter is, with the opioid scourge today, 80% of those who now use heroin began with a legal prescription pill. The stories come by the thousands. Right here in Kentucky, Alex Ellswick. Who, who knows the story of Alex Ellswick here? You've probably heard from Alex. He was a star baseball player, went to center. He suffered from anxiety, he would tell you. He was on stage with, with Trump uh, and, and the, and the uh, National Prescription Drug Abuse and Heroin Summit. He was, he's one of the, the, the best stories to illuminate what this problem really is and what it means. I got to speak after they were on stage, and I, it was in Atlanta, and those of you who know no sports, Matt. I felt like the Atlanta Hawks after everybody left the room after Trump spoke and I got up to speak in Atlanta. Nobody cared and there weren't many people left. Uh, there was a smattering of folks here, there, and here as well. But Alex talked about his journey, which began with plucking his eyebrows clean at the Thanksgiving table, not knowing why he did that. His parents not really noticing. They were great parents, by the way. Shelly, his mother, they have they do great work in addiction recovery now. Alex, again, was this baseball player who began trying to medicate his anxiety. He later had a surgery and was prescribed an opioid, and you, you know where this is headed. It was headed to a bridge in Dayton, Ohio, where he was begging for money and near death wanting to die. And now he's working on his PhD. So for those who tell you recovery isn't possible, I give you Alex Ellswick, and I give you thousands of people that I see in our correction system who recover every day. Just two days ago, I was at one of our facilities in North Point on Lake Harrington in Bergen, right outside Danville. And we announced a dorm called SOAR. It's an honors dorm 
stands for supporting others in active recovery. The fact of the matter is, this isn't an easy road. So as you undertake this challenge, and to me it should be a moral imperative to help those in need and a pragmatic reality for you as well to get people to work. As you look down this road, it's tough. For opioid addiction, the latest study from Harvard says this, that it takes about eight, eight and a half years and about four or five cracks at it to achieve one year of sobriety. The good news is those in active recovery, studies indicate now, can often make the best employees you have. Whether they are suffering in the moment or in recovery and clean and sober at that moment. But make no mistake, addiction by definition is a disease of relapse. It will happen. It happens all the time. And in the criminal justice system, we continue to set people up for failure. We continue to tell them when they come to court, hey, we know you just had a possession charge. We're going to give you five years, by the way, on this felony, We're going to, or three to five. It's, it doesn't matter, right? It's just a few days in prison. But they'll do anything to get out at that moment. Because, by the way, we have far too many people serving pretrial in our county jail. So they, they want to get out. Maybe to get out to use, because the brain's broken at that point. It's rewired. It's completely different than before they started taking that drug. They're not thinking like you and I. They don't have breaks. So they agree to that plea deal, and what happens? They relapse, and then what happens? They go to prison for it. But they've done nothing more than suffer from a chronic brain disorder. And we have 24,000 people in prison. Oh, by the way, 48,000 people on some type of criminal justice supervision, probation, or parole. 48,000. By the way, we only have about 600 officers for that task. About 95 to 1 is their caseload. And oh, by the way, we pay them about $35,000 a year. And I can't find people to work in probation and parole. I can't find people to work in juvenile justice. I'm just going to start venting about this. <laughs> Taxpayers, we need your help. But we have some very dedicated people who do great work and who are transforming the way we deliver services in reentry and substance abuse. We've got more news on the way in the coming weeks and months. So there is good news on the horizon. But of those 48,000 people under supervision in probation or parole and the 24,000 in prison, how many would you guess have a substance use disorder? Not, not always the reason they're there directly, but how many would you guess, percentage-wise? 70%. That's a national average. We don't really have the capability because we don't have the funding to accurately assess, according to ASAM criteria, whether they have a disorder. So I'll, I'll be blunt and tell you that we don't have an, an exact count. And by the way, we discharge 16,000 people a year from state prison alone, so there's this constant churn. So it's difficult to keep track. But I would submit to you that in Kentucky, our numbers are higher for mental illness and addiction. So I would submit to you it's probably more like 80%. Those who self-report that condition is more like 80%. And guess how many treatment slots we have, which we've, we've increased those by well over 1,000% in recent years. We have 6,000 treatment slots total for that 24,000, Dr. Bendapudi, and that 48,000. By the way, you know, both universities are doing our flagship not to... Not to talk, uh, uh, just again, or regional universities as well. I don't want to, <laughs> listen, I don't want to get anybody from Murray or Western or Eastern Mad. They do great work as well. But in this arena, UK and UofL are both doing pioneering work. UK with a HEAL grant, and, and obviously UofL with some really deep dives into our corrections field. First of its kind studies in the country being done at UofL. And this grant at UK is the largest single grant in the history of our state. Right, Tom? We're proud to partner with you in Justice and CHFS to, to, to make that happen. Three-year grant project, $87 million. Kentucky will lead the way. Some more good news in the five minutes I have left before I, before I answer some questions. There is a lot to be concerned about. We cannot sustain this prison population. I met with a group yesterday that said, based on current projections, everyone in this state will be incarcerated in 115 years. I, mean, I laughed, as they did, but that's, that's the truth. It's, according to their numbers, I won't say who that is in case it's wrong. But actually, it, it sounds accurate. 
The good news is we've become a state of firsts in drug policy and criminal justice reform as well. I'll tell you two quick reasons that that, that, that is true. One, we're the first state in the country to mandate the use of a prescription drug monitoring program, our PDMP. And as you know, CASPER is the gold standard and always has been for it. So Kentucky, while experiencing this acute crisis first, along with Ohio, if you've read the book Dreamland or Dope Sick, I highly recommend both books, read Dreamland first and then Dope Sick. But it began in East Kentucky and Northeast or Southeast Ohio, right? Northeast Kentucky, if you believe it, and I believe that it did. So we experienced these problems first, and we got to work in a very bipartisan way. So we're the first state to mandate the use of that PDMP. We're the first state under this administration to adopt the CDC's recommendation that we prescribe for three days only for acute pain, with exceptions, end-of-life issues, to treat the elderly, other exceptions. So we use common sense, but we're the only state to do that. And that recommendation's been out there for some time. And why do they recommend that? Because addiction of opioids to opioids begins between three and five days. So why wouldn't you limit that prescription? Why would we allow people to walk out of offices with 60 pills? And by the way, this state has decreased over the last decade dosage units, thanks to that first law I mentioned, mandating the use of a prescription drug monitoring program, by 100 million units. That is not insignificant. Most states have not done that. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we also have some good indicating, or good indicators, some tracking of our overdose deaths. We think those will be down this year where most states are up. They could change, but we think as of now that those will be down and be down significantly. What else are we doing? We're using employment in the reentry field to get people back to work, and that aids in their recovery in meaningful ways. The transformational effect and the dignity of a job means something to people. That's probably why they make good employees. That's probably why it aids in their recovery, because of the transformational nature, the pride one takes in having a job. And I'll share a quick story with you as well. I, when I, um, again, the, the governor and I, I'll, I'll tell you, I didn't know this governor. I, I, I didn't, didn't know him. He came to me with a singular mission in this field. And I, I can only assume that maybe half this room is on one side of the political aisle, or maybe you're in the middle, maybe you're on the right. But l let me assure you of something. He sincerely believes in this reform and everything that we put forth every day in our advocacy efforts to lower the prison population, to get people back to work. And so we had a conversation. And when I took this appointment, one of the first meetings I had was with our reentry division. And I went in and I said, amongst a number of questions I had for them, I said, how many have you connected? How many of these 16,000 returning Kentuckians have you connected to a job? And they said, zero. This reentry division had been around since 2009. Some of them worked for wardens. Some of them worked in what's called a central office. But it wasn't the fault of these people in front of me. They were passionate people who had ideas and wanted to act on these ideas. Let's fast forward one year later. We hired a director. We doubled our workforce there. The feds doubled their investment in us. And again, I told you about these very bipartisan meetings at the White House, but Vice President Pence, in front of a crowd like this in the White House, said, Look at what they're doing in Kentucky with reentry. That is the model. I've never been more proud of a group of people that encompass all your communities. They are beneath you working if you don't know it. They're out there. And they're trying to partner with you in ways that we never have in transportation, housing, treatment, and yes, employment. And we've connected to substance use in ways we never have. Before, they didn't even talk to one another. But now we've connected in ways we never have. And that'll produce dividends. We've connected to the parole board. We've connected to those who make these decisions to try to guide the lives of the 48,000 people on supervision. Each one of them deserves, and we have embarked upon a plan to give them an individualized roadmap for recovery. And it's beginning to show dividends, prove dividends, as our recidivism, rop has, recidivism rate has dropped for the first time in this state in years. And you, you might ask, well, how much? Well, Dropped a couple percentage points, almost. I'm going to claim two, Kelly, two percentage points. You think, what does that matter? That means thousands of people, by the way, are not going back to prison. That's significant. 
And in my last 10 seconds before I'm joined by Jacqueline for some Q&A, that's your cue, Jacqueline, as you get mic'd up. Oh, no. Oh, uh, Renee's coming. All right. I was trying to be right on time. See, there, I'm, I'm supposed to be out of time. I'm getting the hook. Let me, let me end by saying this. I think this is a call to arms for all of us. I think this is the issue of our day. And the business community, the business and industry community in this state has been a leader in this field for some time. And there's no reason. I just came from a meeting just a few miles from here where a dedicated group of corporate executives are looking to hire folks, not only with criminal records, but those who are in active recovery. And that's what it's going to take. And I thank you for that. And I'm, I'm open to, Renee, if I'm open to anything I can answer in 10 minutes or less. Thank you. We want to open it up. I think we have about uh, 12 minutes here before we move to the next thing. So if you want to ask a question, come aboard, and we'll make sure we try to get you in. But I have a couple, All right. as you can imagine. Um, your budget's, what, $650 million? Corrections alone. The cabinet budget's about $1.3 billion. Right. But yes, corrections alone and, is $650 And you mentioned that's not adequate? It, it is inadequate. We, we pay people as, as we... And listen, this is not something we just discovered, and it's not something we're not trying to change. But we pay, we, we don't have enough corrections officers. We can't pay them enough. The turnover rate, if anyone raises their hand in this, in this room that has a turnover rate of 124%, which we have at juvenile justice with frontline youth workers, does anybody have that kind of turnover rate? There's no way. You wouldn't be in the room today. You'd be, you'd be trying to figure out how to turn that around. I'm sure it's your own mm -hmm. business. But that's what we're facing. It is a crisis. We're trying to maintain public safety and try to deal with our, our most vulnerable population, our most troubled population, and yet we can't even find people because of our, our, budget, our budget constraints, our realities, the fiscal realities we face in this state. We're fighting every day to become more efficient. We found ways to raise salaries. Just last week, we announced a 12% raise for probation and parole officers by finding efficiencies within the department. But we need more. Yes. Kim Sweezy, ask a question, please. Hi, I'm Kim Sweezy with Toyota Motor Manufacturing. Um, in March, the HHS had uh, expanded their giving of a, about $487 million to be able to expand treatment for opioids. Um, that puts us at about $1.4 billion. But my understanding from friends in drug court and law enforcement that meth has made a huge comeback. And meth west of the Mississippi mm -hmm is really one of the biggest drug threats that's going on. A lot of this funding, my understanding, does not cover meth addiction. It's more with opioids. What are we doing here to combat that before it starts coming towards us? Well, first of all, I would say that that's absolutely correct, but I would just change one part of that. Meth really never left. It's now coming back. As, as, it, it has come back, but it's come back over the southern border as more pure. So that you're not talking about labs. You know, spread out across our state. You're talking about this incredibly pure form that is deadly in the sense that it's a big threat to law enforcement because folks who are addicted to opioids typically don't, don't possess this superhuman threat and they're not as agitated or angered or excitable, but the meth addict is and it presents a real threat. And it is really taking root again in, in the western part of our state, but we're, we're seeing it all over. So to your question, I think, I, th I just talked to Jim Carroll, who is our, our current drug czar at the White House. They are very, uh, and very aware, acutely aware of this reality. And I think those in Congress can, can turn and make certain that these, these funding streams are available to treat all manner of addiction. You know, just today, this, we in the administration have supported this waiver to take treatment beds from the limit of 16 to like a, you know, 120, and that's happening beneath our feet. And so to your point, we have to make certain that all addiction can be treated in our residential centers and on an outpatient basis, because that can be just as effective and less costly. Thank you. Next, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Shannon White. I'm the vice president at Centerstone, used to be called Seven County Services. We are the largest community mental health organization in the region, mm -hmm. and we are helping build a pathway to recovery for tens of thousands of people in our community every day, every year. And we are really trying to build a model. I keep hearing at business summits that employers really want to employ people in recovery, and we have people in recovery that want a job. So we are building a framework for, based on a project in Indiana called the Belden Project. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar with that. I am. 
Yep. And so we are looking for partners with that. So if people are interested, they can get in touch with Centerstone. My email address is shannon.white at centerstone.org. So <laughs> if you are an employer and you want to employ people in recovery, we'd love to have your help. Yeah. Well, and I would also say Centerstone does great work mm -hmm. and a lot of, a lot of fields, obviously a, a partner with you on stepping up and the living room model and all things that we don't have. I know that and it hurts. I just, uh, I will, listen, I, it's not the first thought, I promise. Uh, we, we, do have, we do have funding streams from CORE and, and, and 21st Century Cures money that might be a possibility. So, Amy? Yes, my name is Amy Luttrell, and I'm the CEO for Goodwill of Kentucky, and we do a lot of work in helping our returning citizens stabilize their lives and get jobs, become part of this uh, great economy. And we had an experience yesterday that I'd just like for employers to know about. The Kentucky Department of Corrections put on something called a reentry simulation mm -hmm. for about 50 of our board and staff, and it was very enlightening to particularly our board members and I think would be to employers who uh, are trying to employ these people to understand the barriers that they have, but there are services available to help them overcome those barriers so they can become excellent employees. So Department of Corrections did that for us. It takes about an hour and a half, and it was a very uh, informative session. So just wanted everybody to know about that. Thank you. And I'll say thanks to Goodwill. Goodwill's been doing work in this field for a long time. I know Dennis Ritchie is my contact for, for what you do, and, and uh, thank you for that. Yeah. Final question, yes, sir. Uh, Darby Turner with Bingham Greenbaum Dahl. Yeah, my, my question really is uh, with those that are incarcerated, you have them, you have them isolated, what's going on with regard to treatment and recovery within the facilities? Well, what a great question to end on. First of all, uh, as much as we can, but not enough. And let me explain that. So we have roughly 1,600 treatment slots behind the wall, but if you believe the numbers, we have a much greater need and demand. We, uh, we don't even have a line item from the legislature. I'm not blaming, I mean, listen, that's just not, it's just a reality. We, we don't have any funding to pay for that, those, that programming. It comes from canteen money. It comes from the inmates' own spending to provide this programming. Otherwise, we don't have it. it it costs us about $25,000 a year to incarcerate one inmate uh, for a year. By the way, it costs us over, well over six figures to incarcerate a juvenile for one year. The good news is we've cut our population of the juveniles in half and closed four facilities. Wish we could do the same at the adult level. We have stabilized that. But we are using every resource possible. We're using cognitive behavioral therapy along with good, solid drug treatment. And I can tell you, your state of Kentucky is not behind. You know what Mark Twain said about us, right? He wants to die here because everything here happens 20 years later, right? <laughs> not behind the walls of these prisons and not in drug policy and not in reform because we're using the best practices despite some opposition to medically assisted treatment. It is absolutely the best practice to battle back opioids. So we're using it in corrections. We're using it in our county jails. We're using it in ways with Hazel and Betty Ford that nobody else in the country has used it yet. So we're, I think we're leading the way. It's going to take a while to get out of this. And so be patient, but there are indicators that Kentucky is turning the corner faster than most states in this arena. Thank you, Secretary Attili. And I assume that the numbers from the Office of Drug Control Policy come out this month? They do. Okay, so we'll be looking for that, and we hope that they're down. And I, I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Secretary Attili, give him a round of applause.